Good morning, GC Church, and Merry Christmas. How awesome of an opportunity do we have to worship and celebrate the birth of our Savior. Come worship with us. Born unto us this day, a Savior. Gifted from heaven to a manger. The hope of the world alive for all mankind. All of the earth rejoice, it's Christmas time. Yeah. So lift up your voice and sing out his praise. It's Christmas, born is the king, rejoice in the day. It's Christmas, make a joyful sound. It's Christmas, let His praise resound. It's Christmas, do 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 Goodwill to all the earth and peace divine. All of the earth rejoice. It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. Yes. So lift up your voice and sing out His praise. It's Christmas. Born is the King. Rejoice in the day. It's Christmas, make a joyful sound. It's Christmas, let His praise resound. It's Christmas, so lift up your voice and sing out His praise. It's Christmas, born is the King, rejoice in the day. It's Christmas, make a joyful sound. It's Christmas, let His praise resound. It's Christmas, do 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 It's Christmas, do 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 Lift up your voice and sing out His praise. It's Christmas, born is the King, rejoice in the day. It's Christmas, make a joyful sound. It's Christmas, let His praise resound. It's Christmas. It is Christmas today. So we have a reason to celebrate. Come on, if you've got joy in your heart, joy in your soul, why don't you just sing this with us this morning? Well, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing we will sing 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 oh joy to the To the world, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ. Who are fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains. 
Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. We will sing, sing, sing. We sing joy to Righteousness and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. We will sing, 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 we sing it. Joy to the about our joy that came to the earth the joy that came to the earth we're singing 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 mm. the
Greeted on this Lord's Day at the most wonderful time of the year. We'd like to use a, a thought today that should be near all of our hearts. And I'll probably try to break it down into language that we can understand. Rather than to go into a deep theological discourse, 
I thought we'd just talk about today and how we view and look at Christmas. And the best way I know how to conclude that is to suggest to you that Christmas is for children. Or may I add that it's a blue light special that we will explain a little later. The prophet Isaiah had much to say about this moment in time. But one of the most powerful thoughts that he shared with us is simply these words, for unto us a child is born. As one travels in the northwest part of the United States, you will come from time to time to a road sign that says Continental Divide. At this point, the watershed of North America continent is found. A drop of water that falls on the eastern side begins its journey toward the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. A drop of rain on the western side flows into the Pacific Ocean. The birth of Jesus is the watershed of human history. The birth of Christ divides the events of the past as well as the future. It was the great and pivotal event of all of history. The impact or the birth of this baby that we call Jesus. It was this true then and even more so than it is today. A baby changes everything. The prophet Isaiah went on proclaiming, for unto us a child is born. Then he would say in chapter 7, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Because Jesus was a baby that first Christmas, this season has a special significance to children of all ages. Uh, the eager anticipation, the thrilling excitement, the gracious generosity, and the genial goodwill toward all of the little child Jesus somehow rubs off on us at this magical time of the year for just a little time at Christmas. For a few moments, the charm of our childhood seems to return each Christmas, further proving the point that Christmas is for children. Let's look for a moment at uh, Christmas and Christ, and we'll talk first of all about Christ the baby or Christ the child. There's so many great stories about little boys and Jesus. There was a young lad that had a piece of candy and he was walking around with it. And his parents asked him, son, what are you going to do with that candy? He says, I'm going to give it to Jesus when he grows up. Another little boy had his brand new red wagon out in the church uh, yard and the pastor just happened to walk by as this young lad was there. And, and the pastor looked at him. He said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I, I promised Jesus if I got a wagon for Christmas that I would take him for a ride. So he's at the nativity scene trying to pick up baby Jesus. But I guess my favorite story of little boys and, and, and Jesus includes uh, another party that's very active this time of the year, and that's Santa Claus. He had been mischievous all day long, and mom and dad had corrected him. They had sent him upstairs, downstairs, wherever they could send him that they might finish the project that they were working on. And so finally they got so frustrated, they said, go to your room. The little boy, went, and his mother said to him, I'm going to tell Jesus to tell Santa Claus not to bring you any toys. 
Little boy went to his room all sad and disappointed from the, the words he had heard from his mom. And he waited till the sun went down and the parents were in the bed and he raised his window, climbed out the window, went out to the front yard where the nativity scene was at and he picked Jesus up out of the nativity scene, come back to his bedroom, opened the chest of drawers and, and he's putting Jesus inside the drawer. And just before he closed it, he said to him, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, you'd better not tell Santa Claus anything. Another, another way of expressing the child enjoying this time of the year. But the scripture says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. There are many early signs of the maturation process of the Lord, but one of the greatest stories is found in Luke's gospel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when the day had fulfilled, as they returned, uh, the child Jesus did not uh, go along with them, tarried behind in Jerusalem. Joseph and his mother knew not of it, but they supposing him to have been in the company, when a day's journey they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Listen to what he says. Wish you not that I must be about my father's business. One of the most revealing responses of all scripture. When all of these people that were astonished at this young kid that was responding in this way, they started looking toward him. No doubt their thoughts were, young man, how old are you? And I hear his response. Even though it's not recorded, this is a strong suggestion that this is the way that it could have gone. And Jesus looked back and said, on my mother's side or on my father's side? On my father's side, on my mother's side, I'm only 12. But on my father's side, before Abraham was, I am. I am the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I am the ancient of days. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You see, he knew, he sensed, he understood that there was something going on in his life that his heavenly father, which is our heavenly father, would use at some point to advance his cause upon the face of the earth. He advanced in wisdom and statue and in favor with God and man. He grew into adulthood and he became the author and finisher of our eternal salvation. That's how the young child Jesus, we know very little about his life from his birth to that point and then from that point until he was almost 30 years old, we know even less. But Christ did mature and Christ the man, or should I say Christ is the man, makes this statement. Jesus declared, when asked, who is the greatest among us, Lord? And Jesus said, 
simply brings up a child and he points to this child that he brings up and he makes this statement, except ye become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. May I paraphrase that just a little bit without changing any meaning whatsoever. Except you become as little children, you shall not enjoy the Christmas season. I want you to catch that with this thought in mind. We are reminded of how much we have lost uh, through life's growth into adulthood. We don't know when we lost it. All we know is that it's gone. The lights on the tree bring excitement and, and joy uh, to a child. The adult response is Pity the guy that is paying the electric bill. Pastor, what have we lost? May I suggest to you that we have lost the sense of humility. We have traded our childlike humility for crusty pride. To be humble means that we are teachable. The child is easily taught. Matter of fact, a study that's been around quite some time suggests that a child learns more in the first five years of their life than they do at any other five-year period. They may go to Yale, they may go to Harvard, they may go to UT, they may go somewhere to some of the greatest universities abroad, but they learn more in the first five years of their life than they do at any other time. As we grow older, we go more set in our own opinions and we are less open to new truths. We become satisfied with our present level of understanding. Humility is lost and stubbornness takes over. Not only have we lost our humility, many have lost their sense of innocence. We have exchanged the virtue of innocence for the depressing presence of guilt. Many live their lives under the depression of past sins. They, uh, they rob their soul and life from any happiness that might come their way. But let me say something to you. Hear me carefully. If you know Jesus, smile, God loves you. And one drop of the crimson flow, the blood of the spotless lamb, covers a multitude of our sins and they are cast into God's eternal sea of forgetfulness. I read a story some time back about a man that dreamed that he died and he went to heaven. And he had many questions that he wanted God to answer. And when he stood before God in his conversation with God, he looked at God and he said, Listen, God, help me understand. Do you know that in the book of Hebrew chapter 11, uh, which is uh, uh, the hall of fame for those who served the Lord uh, back in those days. Hey, do you know that you've got a murderer named in that chapter? Uh, why, why, Lord, there is a harlot that is mentioned in that chapter. And God looks at him and very sternly says, I forgot. See, that's what happened. When forgiveness comes our way, then God casts those sins into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered anymore. I would suggest that many of you today need to put up a sign when you go close to that sea, no fishing. Leave them where God has placed them. Here's the picture. Child's been a little rascal a dentist the menace all day long and can lay down and sleep like a, a log. Why? There is a complete sense of innocence. We've not only lost our humility, we've not only lost, many of us have lost our innocence, we've also lost our sense of trust. We have swapped our trust for a suspicious heart, an adult walks into the football arena 
and he sees the team out in the middle and they're huddling to, to make the next play. The adult says, those guys out there talking about me. When the child walks into that same arena, he sees the ball. Tell a child that a certain food is good and most of the time they will take a bite. Try that on an older person and see what your response is. It is natural for a child to trust. He hasn't been hurt many times and has quickly recovered. Teach a child about Jesus and they will accept that beautiful story. But the adult community is not as acceptable to the story of a Lord who loved them so much that while he did not have to come as a baby, he came as a baby. He grew through all of those years and become our Savior. You see, folks, and hear me clearly, there are no atheists in the nursery or elementary schools. There's no bigotry. There's no hatred. There's no racism. It's not there. A child knows nothing about those things. Our humility has, has been lost. Our innocence is, has been lost. Our trust, let's add to that things uh, one more, and that is a sense of the presence. The child does not live in the past. If they do, it's temporary at best. When I was a, a young lad, my, my dad was a pastor, and, and uh, I was uh, nine years old, uh, six through nine. I was in the first, second, and third grade, and, and I, I thought, I've had the same girlfriend all three grades. Boy, dad got moved to another city, and I thought, boy, my life is ruined forever. But he went to another church, and there was someone else. And finally, the Lord led him to Charleston, where I met my bride for over 60 years. But you see, a child doesn't live in the past. They'll soon forget the events of the past and move on. The child is not anxious about the future. Now is God's day, and now is the child's possession. As adults... We are looking and working for tomorrow. Financial security, retirement, peace of mind. Not the child. He's thinking about right now, today. An observation of life through the eyes of an adult, if we could. Let's talk about that for a few moments. Science has made us richer, but it has not made us happier. Our homes and factories are stocked with labor-saving devices, yet we are more exhausted than our grandparents who did everything by hand. We have more leisure time, but are more weary than ever with the emptiness and boredom. Many have more to live with and less to live for. We have more knowledge today and less faith. We have perfected our means of communication and have almost nothing to say. And sometimes when we do it, it's only through a text. We have built splendid cities and allowed the hearts of them to rot in miserable slums. We have conquered space, put in man on the moon, while poverty, hunger, and crime are on a rampage right here in Middle Tennessee. I hope you can see the comparison. It appears as though our Heavenly Father is looking at His children especially in this season of celebration and measuring our growth process. Have we grown too big, too smart, too self-righteous, and too self-sufficient? Have we grown older? Have we grown more cunning, more covetous, more grasping, and more cautious? One thing for certain, if we are to enjoy Christmas, it will require a childlike approach. Let me see if I can bring a perspective to this that will help you understand what we're speaking uh, concerning this morning. When we were pastoring in High Point, North Carolina, 
there was a young lad that attended our church that was greatly challenged mentally from his childhood even through his adulthood. His name was Mike. He was in his late teens at the time of our uh, story with him. And Joyce and I decided that we wanted to do something special for Mike at Christmas. We took him to the happening places, uh, the happening place to shop at that time. We took him to Walmart. It was a brand new store in the community, and everybody was excited about it. We felt in order to express our real concern for Mike that we would need to buy him something, that, and the gift must be expensive. After all, we were trying to express our love for Mike, and we must put a dollar value on our affections. We picked up a Star Wars robot. Requires four batteries. We looked at the price tag, and, well, we felt this would be adequate to express our feelings for Mike. Mike was not interested at all. He picked up a $3.98 plastic bubblegum container and, and locked in on that item. We tried to talk him out of it. We tried to point to other things, uh, but none of this was helping us. Then our adult mind kicked in. What will his family think of us spending $4 on their child? Uh, 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 boy, we're cheap, probably they would have thought. But none of our persuasions would distract Mike from his choice. Then it happened. As we continued to look for other more impressive and expensive gifts, Mike said, Brother Smith, right in the middle of Kmart, Brother Smith. I said, yes, Mike. He says, I love you. Wow. I rushed to where Mike was. I put my arms around him. And, and, and I, I wanted to grab the microphone and, and say to all of the shoppers in that store, uh, you, you listen to me just a moment, people. If you'll go to aisle 14, see back in those days, Walmart, uh, excuse me, Kmart had, had a blue light. And if that blue light was burning, that mean the best deal of the hour was wherever that blue light was at. And I, I was convinced that I had found a blue light special. And I wanted to say to all of the shoppers, rush to aisle 14. You will find displayed uh, in, in, in full array the real spirit of this holiday season. And, and all of a sudden, uh, Mike embraced me and I embraced him. And we settled for that $4 gift when we were prepared to spend a lot more. You see, with Mike, there was no crusty adult pride. There was no hypocrisy. There was no resentment. There was no concern for what others were going to think. And at this point, it hit me. If it's okay for Mike to call me Brother Smith at church, Mike feels like it's okay to call me Brother Smith at the shopping place. Oh, and, but what we had that moment, it's not for sale. It only comes as we understand everything that God is doing at this time of the year. And I, and I know the question going through your mind, Pastor, are you suggesting that we all revert back to Mike's level? Oh, no, no, no. Quite the contrary. I'm strongly urging you at this day and this time, me and my family, you and your family, pull ourselves up to Mike's level. Other words, be like Mike because he understood what it was all about. It wasn't the price of the gift. 
it was an opportunity for us to share our concern. And why would I say be like Mike? Because the good book says they shall be led by a child. And what, how did that first Christmas start off? They were all looking for a child. For unto us a child is born. And that is my prayer for you this Christmas season that you understand to, if you really want to enjoy this season one more time, be like Mike. I think there are four simple steps to reclaim the true meaning of Christmas. Maybe the next time you go before the Lord to have a conversation with him that you put a child, a childlike spirit on your request list. God, let the excitement and glow of our childhood return. And, and then shed or get rid of our cynicism, our prejudices, and our fears. Believe the best about others. I guess the most relevant question that we all will have to answer. Mary, did you know who your son really is? Joseph, did you know? How about his shepherds? Were you aware? Did you know? Wise men, you knew when you had found the right baby. Theologians, do you know in this hour who Jesus is? Preachers, do you know? And are you sharing with your congregation that a baby does change our lives because he grew and matured and sacrificed the spotless life that he lived for the sins of all others? There's so many questions, but I certainly want to say to, to my family, Jerry and Joyce, and all of the kids, do you know? It's important that we answer that question. The day before Christmas was hectic. Father was worried with bundles and burdens. Mother's nerves reached the breaking point more than once. The little girl seemed to be in the way wherever she went. Finally, she hustled up to bed. As she knelt to pray, feverish excitement so mixed her up that she said, Dear Lord, forgive us of our Christmases as we forgive those who Christmas against us. Well, what a wonderful prayer for us all to adopt this season. Oh, I, I, I believe in Santa's cause. I think it's a wonderful idea to give gifts to others. The Lord gave us the greatest gift of all. But I don't want to lose the main thing. And that is unto us, unto me, unto you, unto all who are watching or listening today. A child is given, given to us that he might become our Lord and Savior. Bow your heads with me for just a moment, wherever you may be, watching or listening. Allow me to pray. And as I pray, if you would like to join in with me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to celebrate the birth of your Son and our Lord. We thank you for the privilege of, of saying to you, Abba, Father, but that privilege was granted to us through the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And God, I pray today that in every home that is listening around the world, that you would extend to them a measure of childlikeness that we could all become more like Jesus that first Christmas and that our lives could be changed all over again, re-gift to us 
a measure of grace and mercy. And may the power of your Holy Spirit lead and direct everything that we do from this day forward. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.